Welcome to Dallas County's 1892 Old Red Courthouse. I'm Evelyn Montgomery. I'm the executive director of the Old Red Museum that has the honor to be in this beautiful building. It was designed by a young architect named Max Orlop. He's not one of the famous ones for doing Texas courthouses, but he did a lovely job on this one. He designed it in the Richardson Romanesque style. And that was an American version of a European revival of the style that came before Gothic. So it's supposed to look sort of medieval, sort of rough. You'll notice that the stones are a bit rough hewn. That's a classic aspect of that style. Also, they use a lot of round arches. Look how they're low, wide round arches. And look at the columns holding them up. They're so short and chubby. They're adorable. This was not a classic style with classic columns. They were supposed to look like that. It's really a very excellent example. Now, why did Dallas spend so much money to build such an impressive building? Well, it spoke to what an important county Dallas was. We needed a courthouse that impressed the other areas of Texas. And in the 1890s, a lot of counties all over Texas are building castle-like structures, but ours is the best. It's called Old Red because of the Pecos Red Sandstone that makes up most of the stone. The red marble of the columns is also from Dallas, but the blue came from Little Rock. Our first speaker for today is Marcel Quimby, a noted local preservation architect with her own firm, Quimby Preservation Studio. She has worked on restoration of important buildings in Dallas, including the Hall of State and the Majestic Theater. She loves researching their history and has written many nominations putting Dallas landmarks on the National Register. She's also served on the Dallas Landmark Commission and is president of both Preservation Dallas and AIA Dallas. She has previously shared her research with legacies, like her work on Dr. Benjamin Blewett. Today, she will be discussing historic jails in Dallas. Welcome to Historic Jails in Dallas. This discussion will talk, will talk about the three remaining historic jails in downtown Dallas, and we'll address their history and a little bit about the architecture. And there's a couple of themes about these buildings. First of all, criminal justice had a lot of improvements in the early 20th century. Um, I'm getting the sense from reading and research I've done is that the late 1800s were somewhat lawless and jail escapes were common. The city and the county wanted safe, secure jails, and both of them did such within the first two decades of the century. Both the city and the county were prepared for the growth that had started with Dallas during the railroad coming to town and was certainly growing fast in the early years of the 20th century. I'm gonna talk about the city of Dallas and Dallas County jails, and I'm gonna start with the first two in the city of Dallas. But first I'll provide an overview of the history of the city and its buildings. The um, city government met in a series of um, lease buildings until 1872. And at that stage of the game, they built their first two-story building at the corner of Main and Ackard Streets and accommodated the city offices on the second floor. In, 19, in 1881, they moved to the new building at the Commerce in Lamar, which was also a two-story building with a fire station at the first floor. This was Dallas's second city hall. The third city hall was in, occurred in 1889 when with a new magnificently, magnificent, slightly Gothic style city hall was constructed, three stories in height, a thousand person auditorium within it, and it was remarkable in its design. The city received an offer too good to pass up in 1910 to sell the building to Adolphus Bush for a new hotel. We now know that as the Adolphus Tower. As the city had outgrown the building, they, um, they moved out of the building in 1910 and in 1911, they purchased property at the corner of, ha of Harwood, Main, and Commerce Streets. This was a large block, and it enabled them to build a, a tall five-story building that we now know as the Dallas Municipal Building. In 1881, this, up until 1881, the city marshal was responsible for keeping peace in Dallas. And in that year, this was replaced by a formal police department. Concern was expressed about the poor condition of the jail in the early 1900s, and by 1902, articles were written in the Dallas Morning News on a regular basis about these conditions and complaints. In November of 1905, the bond proposal passed 
from the new jail for $27,500. And two years later, they finally selected a site. They chose to build the new city hall on the site of the city stables, which was in the wet, what we now know as the West End on Ross Street. Dallas architect H.A. Overbeck was selected to design this new jail. They produced drawings, and in, in October 1907, uh, L.R. Wright was hired as a contractor for the building. His fee was $20,000 um, for construction. Um, the new jail was completed in May of 1908. Um, it was built out of brick walls, and its goal was to eliminate escapees by detainees and prisoners, again, providing a safe facility. The new jail building was far better than anything else that they had had, where not only did they have the jail, which uh, separate space, you know, sales for men, women, they had, they had provided juveniles, dedicated juvenile space. Um, for the first time. They also had courtrooms for the city court, judge's office, jury room, um, separate men and women exercise areas, and a matron's quarter who lived there with a li in a living room, bedroom, and bathroom, as well as a jail. Jailer lived on the first floor. It was typical at that point in time for the jailer's wife to also be the cook for the jail, so they had an apartment in the building. There were four full-time staff at the jail. There was the jailer, the matron, there was a day watch and a night watch person. Um, the building still stands. It's located at 700 Ross Avenue. It has been a restaurant and is currently an office building and it's in very good condition. The building has several designations. It's in the city of Dallas West End Historic District and also the, the West End National Register District. So back to the bigger picture with the city of Dallas and the Dallas Municipal Building. Dallas had purchased a large lot at the east end of town at Ar Harwood Made in Commerce. And in 1912, they um, proposed a bond issue which passed for $475,000. Architect C.D. Hill was selected to design the building. And two months later, the city requested that he bring on a more substantial architect to work with him, and he selected Moran, Russell, and Kroll of St. Louis, who became the consulting architect on the project. The new building was a five-story building, Beau Arts style, with two basement levels. At that time, it was one of the most elaborate buildings in Texas and one of the few of this style in the state. The jail was located on the fifth floor um, the jail space was located on the fifth floor, and the jail that had previously been built just a couple of years before was relocated to this new building. The interior of the building was very elaborate. There was marble floors, a grand marble staircase that went from the first floor up to the op through the office spaces. The exterior was Indiana limestone. Some rooms were metal with also tile roofs. It was, it was organized and planned with a, east, a long east-west corridor, which was penetrated at the first floor with another corridor entered from Harwood Street. The remaining areas were divided up into courtrooms at the first floor with offices at the second, third, and fourth floors. Like I said, the half of the floor, there was a large auditorium also in this building, um, and it had the southern half of the building with leaving half of the fifth floor for the new jail in its new location. The building was used, remained as Dallas City Hall and was known by Dallas City Hall by, by 1963. In 1955, there had been an annex in addition to the rear, which included additional courtroom space. The police department was located on the third floor with the jail intake area in the basement, and they were connected by an elevator. This, this is important as the building is most known for its association with the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963. At an H, um, a historic structures report completed in the early 2000s documented the historic areas and documented the changes that had made, been made to the building from 1914 when it was built um, to the early 2000s, and these diagrams illustrate that. November 22nd, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald was taken into custody at the, at the Texas Theater for the suspicion of murder of Officer Tippett in Oak Cliff. While he was waiting to be processed, 
the arresting officer became aware that the police department was looking for Oswald in conjunction with, you know, um, with the school book depository. He was the only employee there that was unaccounted for. Oswald was brought to this, realizing that they had the same suspect for both murders. Recent murders that afternoon, Oswald was taken to the police department's homicide and burglary bureau and interrogated by Captain Fritz. Um, Oswald would continue to be interrogated for the remainder of Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. While he was being interrogated, um, there was another story that was equally important that was developing outside the office, that of the media as, at, as this story was developing. Uh, this was the first um, live activity since the advent of the new media of television and everyone across, not only in the US but across the world was watching on TV. As a result, the media showed up in droves. Some of these photographs will illustrate what was going on in the corridor outside the police department. Oswald was taken to the fifth floor and remained in a jail cell there both nights he was in the building. On Sunday morning, Oswald was scheduled to be transported to the Dallas County Jail, which was a standard practice for minor offenses. He was interrogated and then brought down to the basement where while he was being transferred to the car, Jack Ruby came out of the horde of journalists that were also gathered and shot at, um, shot killing with a fatal shot for Oswald. He was immediately taken to Parkland Hospital instead of being taken to the jail where he died shortly uh, thereafter. Of interest, there were two local photographers at the scene, Jack uh, Beers, who got a great view of Oswald being led to the car with Ruby in the foreground. Just a sixteenth of a second later, the Dallas T Times Herald photographer Robert Jackson was at a slightly different angle and took a different shot, that of the bullet hitting Oswald at the moment of impact. This is the, the second photograph by Jackson is the one that won the um, um, Pulitzer Prize for photography later that year. In summary, the Dallas, building, Dallas Municipal Building remains in place and is looking great. It, went under, it underwent an interior rehabilitation for its new use as University of North Texas Law School. The first floor is, was restored to its original appearance and the remaining floors have been rehabbed and restored and selected areas restored as, as part of the uni new university. And again, it has a number of designations, Harwood Street, Dallas Landmark, recorded Texas Historic Landmark, um, State Antiquities, and it's in the downtown Dallas National Register District. The third jail we're gonna talk about is the Dallas County Criminal Courts Building um, at the, across from Old Red in the western portion of the city, um, I'm sorry, the western portion of downtown. This, the property was purchased in 1913, and in 19, uh, later that year, Dallas County hired architect H.A. Overbeck for the building. He and Dallas County official turned modern jails up in the northeast and came back with great ideas for this new secure jail. Um, one of its goals was to not allow escapees as the previous jails had been done. A couple of things that we're gonna, that the building is known for and is interest in the history is that, that there were actually, there is a death row up on the top floor and actually three men were executed by hanging um, between 1915 and 1921, at which time the state of Texas required that such events happen at Huntsville. Um, in 1923, Deputy Willis Glover Champion was shot and killed in an attempted jail breakout. Ten years later, Harvey Bailey successfully escapes from the jail. He's captured in Oklahoma later that day. In 1948, Matron Jesse May Chandler was killed by a female juvenile inmates in the jail. She was the first woman officer killed in the line of duty in Texas. The annex to the Dallas, Rick, Dallas County Records Building was completed in 1955, which completed construction by the county on the entire site. And renovations were made to the jail and to the courts in the 1950s and the 1960s, including air conditioning in the 1970s. In 1964, they, you know, part two of our association with the events of the assassination of, Je of President Kennedy 
um, you know, end in this building. Jack Ruby was arrested immediately, uh, brought to the Dallas County Criminal Courts building, and was held um, in the building and asked, actually had his trial on the second floor in the, one of the courtrooms where he was found guilty. He was detained in the criminal courts building. After that, his case was appealed and he had, was able to leave the jail um, while he was on pending a new trial and he chose not to. He felt more secure in the building and asked to remain there, which he did until December 66, at which time he was ill and um, remanded to Parkland where it was discovered he had lung cancer and died shortly thereafter. In 1967, the Dallas County Government Center and its jail was open and the jail in the criminal courts building was closed and then mothballed. In the, in the 70s, the, government, the new jail was overcrowded and the criminal courts building jail was reopened again, only to close in 1983 for good when the Lou Sterrett criminal jail opened um, and all the inmates were moved to that building. So I'm going to, now that I've given an overview of the building and its complex history, I'm going to dive into a little bit more detail about some of the interesting areas of the buildings, um, including some photographs. Um, one of the issues, the first floor has, was grand with, again, white marble staircase and floors, um, beautiful plaster ceilings. Um, many of which have been covered up over the years. Um, the exterior of the building is divided into two zones. You can tell the, the areas that are outlined in terracotta at the first two floors are where the, the courts and the offices are, associated offices. The upper areas of the building are the jail, and those are actually two very tall spaces that were designed to accommodate steel jails that would be built within these spaces after the construction of the building was done. It was a very common way to build jail cells um, at that point in time. The second floor and contained the courtrooms, um, and it had two courtrooms plus court functions, uh, with co included dormitories for men at that stage of the game, women were not allowed to serve in, in Texas, as jurors in Texas, until 1954. Um, and the, those dormitories were used until people could make it to and from their houses within the day. Here's some photographs of some of the historic spaces and details within that floor. And back to the jail structure, the photograph shows how the, this construction happened with the jail cell construction happening within this big void. Unfortunately, these jail cell structures with multiple coats of lead paint could not be reused, and these spaces have been filled in with new floors in the current construction. And some other unique spaces in the building are the chapel um, that was available for um, men and women to practice the religion in, to attend religious services. The Sally Port, which is the heart of the jail for its control by the jailers. And the Baptistry, which is a non-historic build space within the building, but it has painted walls and murals by, by the inmates um, that dates from the 1970s. The upper floor of the building, the, the tallest floor of the building was a two-story space, and this was unfinished throughout, and it remains unfinished to this day. Um, at one time, part of it was finished out as juror dormitories with five-foot hall partitions, and then this was where the death row was held, and a scaffolding was actually, a wood scaffolding was erected for each of the three hangings that served as a gallows built outside the death row cord, death, death row cells. While the Dallas criminal Courts building was built as one of the taller buildings in Dallas. It has since been incorporated into the records building complex. After being vacant and closed since 1983, it will soon open again, although in a different context. As I'm sure you all agree that the Dallas County is to be commended in returning their historic buildings to the seat, seat of Dallas County government in the coming year. Gensler was the architect of record for this project. Thank you very much for attending. Here we are at the grand staircase of the old red courthouse. 
always an impressive and beautiful feature of a nice courthouse. I'm sure that in the 1890s, when this courthouse first opened, people were impressed. And then in 2007, when the museum opened in the courthouse, people were impressed again. But it wasn't the same staircase. You see, when this courthouse opened in 1892, they thought it was the biggest building that the county of Dallas could ever need for their legal purposes. They were, of course, wrong. And within about 10 years, they knew it. And they started trying to pack more offices and uses into this building. So by 1928, what they did to the stairway is they cut it down into one tiny little piece over on the side, and then they filled in floors up above and built offices out to where the staircase used to be. So much for grandeur, so much for impressing people with the importance of Dallas. They were trying to get the work of Dallas done within this building. And that began about 80 years of packing more and more offices and uses into this place, deteriorating its appearance while trying to keep up with necessity. Here's what the stair looked like when it was just the ghost of its former self, a teeny tiny little useful stair off into the corner. You see, they kept the original parts, they just didn't keep many of them. And here we see some images of when it was being rebuilt for the restoration. Now, the reason you could have this beautiful stair affordably was that it came in pieces which had been made in a factory, probably in the Midwest, and arrived here on Dallas's wonderful system of railroads. Our next speaker for today is well known in Dallas history circles, Rosemary Rumbly. She holds a PhD in communications from the University of North Texas. She served as a professor of speech and theater at Dallas Baptist University for 12 years and a single adult minister at First Baptist Church for seven years. She also appeared on the stage at the Dallas Summer Musicals and at Casa Manana in Fort Worth. Today, she's on the speaking circuit and she enjoys researching each and every topic. Rosemary has two grown children and one grandchild. And today, she's gonna to share with us a fun look at crime in Dallas. Well, everyone, what I'm bringing to you today, I cannot prove. I can only say that I was there when it happened. My mother was there when it happened. And my father was there when it happened. And we'll start with my mother. Now, I've titled this The Lighter Side of Crime. My mother was born in Dallas, Texas in 1894. Her father came from Germany and opened a bakery in 1884 titled it, called it, The West End Bakery. And my, it was across the street from the courthouse, Old Red, on Main Street. Mother, mother always said, Caddy cornered from the courthouse on Main Street, The West End Bakery, and that's where she grew up. Now, she also always said, the German immigrants opened bakeries. The Italians opened grocery stores. The Greeks opened restaurants, and the Irish opened saloons. And there was a saloon on every corner in Dallas, and probably two or three in the middle of the block. It was a Wild West town. Now, the Curtis Saloon was next door to the bakery. So Mother observed as a child, that number one, only men went into the saloon, and if you were a fairly wealthy gentleman and you got drunk, Mr. Curtis would allow you to sleep it off in the back of the saloon on a cot. But if you were poor and you drank up all your money and there was no more, Mr. Curtis would toss you out on the, on the sidewalk, on the curb, outside. And there the hoodlum wagon, that's what it was called, a uh, horse drawn, would come and pick you up and you would sleep it off, the drunk, you'd sleep your drunk off uh, in jail. So my mother deducted right away that if you were going to get drunk, you should be rich. Now the 18th Amendment, which outlawed alcohol was passed. Mother is now a 
young lady, and they were so they, my mother and all the girls and uh, her mother, were so thrilled over the 18th Amendment. No more drunks on the street. How marvelous. Ha, ha, ha. The liquor industry went underground and produced a lot of criminals. We'll get to that in a minute. But right now, let's look at some bathtub brew, because that's what happened. People began to make their own alcohol. Mother and daddy, a young couple, uh, lived in what is called today Lower Greenville. They lived in a little house, it's still standing, on Macmillan, a couple of streets up from Henderson. And uh, they lived next door to the Andrews. And uh, Mr. Andrews made beer, bathtub brew. He didn't know anything about making beer, but he did anyway. And he brought my daddy a bottle of beer. Daddy was smart enough to know Mr. Andrews knew nothing about beer. In fact, people died drinking this home brew, this homemade alcohol. It was poison. And Daddy opened the beer and poured it, beer bottle, and poured it down uh, the, the sink. Now, the people in Lower Greenville at that time were claiming that the sewage line was stopped up. It wasn't running properly, clogged. But after my father poured Mr. Andrews' home brew down the sewerage, it was like a shot of Drano, and it unclogged the sewerage in Lower Greenville. Now, what happened with, these, uh, uh, with the liquor business going underground it was pretty well controlled by the mob, Al Capone and his guys, and all these criminals evolved. Now, the criminals in those days, in the Roaring Twenties, had personalities. Pretty Boy Floyd, <laughs> Machine Gun Kelly, they had personalities. Anybody today can be a criminal, but in those days, individuality personalities. And no one had a more personality-filled uh, criminals, plural, because there were two of them, than Dallas with Bonnie and Clyde. Now, my mother always referred to Bonnie and Clyde as low-down common trash. She was appalled by that movie. They were ugly. They didn't look like those movie stars. They were low-down common trash. Now, uh, common, that was my mother's favorite word. You couldn't be common. I lived in the fear of being common all of my life. It's a southern term. My mother had levels of commonness. There was common, there was common trash, and then there was low-down common trash. And she always referred to Bonnie and Clyde as low-down common trash. Now, there was an infamous criminal in Dallas, murderer, killer, in Dallas, by the name of Dagger Pruitt. My father often spoke of Dagger Pruitt. Dagger Pruitt, killer, um, when a car would stop at a red light, Dagger Pruitt, loose in the, uh, the personality of the 30s in Dallas, one of the per personable criminals, he would open the driver's door, the car stopped at a red light, open the driver's door, and plunge a dagger into his victim. And because he often left the daggers there in the body, <laughs> he was referred to as Dagger Pruitt. My daddy loved to tell this story. Mother had called, uh, bring some groceries home, a list of groceries, and it was a dark, dreary night. And daddy had the groceries there on the passenger side of the, uh, in the car, stopped for a red light. When he did, the grocery sack fell over on him and a can of peas lodged until he, into his ribs. And the first thing he thought of was, 
Dagger Pruitt has me. Love to tell that story. He also said, uh, told of seeing Dagger Pruitt. The police got him. Dagger was arrested. Dagger Pruitt was going to go on trial for all these murders. He was in jail. Now, in those days, if you wanted to visit the jail, you could. May I go in and see some prisoners? Sure. D Daddy wanted to see Dagger Pruitt because uh, Dagger also billed himself as the best-dressed man in jail. He wore a coat and tie to greet his visitors. And my daddy got to visit with Dagger Pruitt. Now, let us think of the Hamilton brothers at this time. Hamilton brothers in uh, West Dallas. Uh, you marvelous Methodists have a center in West Dallas called Wesley Rankin, named for John Wesley, founder of Methodism, and Hattie Rankin, a Methodist minister, missionary, who served the people in West Dallas. Now, Mrs. Hamilton had two boys, Roland and Floyd. Roland was executed in Huntsville. He'd murdered several people. And Hattie Rankin was there for comfort from Mrs. Hamilton. She stayed with her the night that uh, Roland Hamilton was executed in Huntsville. Now, Floyd, he was in Alcatraz. Uh, Mrs. Hamilton didn't do too well with her sons. He, uh, Floyd in Alcatraz, uh, it was learned by Hattie Rankin that he was up for parole. So Hattie called her good buddy. Evidently, uh, she wasn't as close to a Methodist preacher as she was to the Baptist preacher, W.A. Criswell. She called Dr. Criswell and she said, um, Dr. Criswell, Floyd Hamilton is in Alcatraz, about to be paroled. Go to Alcatraz and lead him to the Lord. And Dr. Criswell led Floyd Hamilton to the Lord. Now, some time later, Floyd was paroled. Now, Dr. Criswell went to W.O. Bankston, who had an Oldsmobile dealership on Ross Avenue, and said, Now, W.O., you must give this fine lad, who's just out of Alcatraz, uh, a job. And W.O. Bankston did just that. Now, at that time, my good friend, Helen Town, who's very much alive, very good friend of mine, was Mr. Bankston, Bankston's private secretary. And uh, uh, she would work late sometimes, and Mr. Bankston would say, now, Helen, you cannot walk to your car alone in the dark. Floyd, escort Helen to her car. And she didn't know he had just come out of Alcatraz. She always said, he was so nice. By the way, Dr. Criswell was my pastor at uh, First Baptist Church, downtown Dallas, and he always called my mother Mrs. John Neely Bryan because she spoke of the old days of Dallas, and Dr. Criswell always appreciated just uh, that. Now, um, speaking of First Baptist Church, downtown Dallas, it was 100, the church was 150 years old in 2018. And um, my pastor, Robert Jeffers, asked me to write the history of this church. And if you came to that celebration, that birthday party day, if you came, you got a copy of my book, 
on the church, you got a Bible and a cupcake. 150 years of First Baptist Church. Now this brings me to a man that changed Dallas, Dr. George W. Truitt. I knew Dr. Truitt. That's one of the reasons I was asked to write the history. He came to Dallas as pastor in 1897. I didn't know him then. I met him later. And he was pastor from 1897 to 1944 when he died. Now, Dr. George Washington Truett, Dr. George W. Truett, was good, great at getting money from stingy, rich Baptists. He was from the Carolinas, but he was pastoring in White Wright, Texas, in 1890 when Baylor University was about to close. They had no money. We're going to lose Baylor. Get Dr. Truett. So he went to Waco, found some rich Baptists, got the money, saved Baylor University. Now, he stayed in Baylor, in Waco rather, at Baylor, in Waco, uh, until 1897 when First Baptist Dallas called him to come. And he came with three goals. This is what he wanted to do. Number one, shut down the saloons. Close them. Get rid of alcohol. Well, the 18th Amendment was passed. Secondly, better race relationships. It was odd, but at the turn of the century, in the early 1900s, there was some racial unrest. And then, by the end of World War I, the Ku Klux Klan had risen, raised its wicked head, and Dr. Truett was instrumental in putting down the Ku Klux Klan in Dallas. The church, see, was very near a, a black uh, residential area. Uh, the Arts District, that was an area called North Dallas, and it was uh, a black residential area. That's why that church, St. Paul's Methodist Church, is there on Ruth Street, a black Methodist church, the oldest black Methodist church in Dallas. Education started in the basement of that church. And um, the uh, uh, Dallas school system then, when it built the high school, built Booker T. Washington across the street from that church. That was all a black residential area, very near First Baptist, very near the cathedral, very near the Methodist, all still there. And uh, Dr. Truett was very, very uh, sold, uh, convinced that relationships, racial relationships, good racial relationships was so very, very important. So he was able to uh, force the Klan in Dallas to disband. And then... He was going to close down, Dr. George W. Truett was going to close down the red light district. Now we got to go back to my mother. My mother knew about, as a child, knew about that red light district. Uh, it, today it would be in the 2100 block of Griffin. Uh, there was a street there named Broom. And that was known as Frogtown and um, uh, the Red Light District. Prostitution, wide open prostitution, right there. And Mother knew of the conversation, uh, the adult conversation about the Red Light District. Children are funny. <laughs> they sense evil. They don't know why, but they know it is. And when the girls from the red light district, came to the bakery. 
My grandmother always gave them a cup of coffee and a donut. Of course, they were customers. But my mother always knew, she said, <laughs> that something was amiss with those girls in that red light district. And it existed. Wide open prostitution. Now, Dr. George W. Truett, from the pulpit, began to preach the evil in that red light district. But he blamed the men. You men, you're the evil. Those women, those girls, they're victims of your evil. Always preaching in that way. Then he discovered that the houses in that red light district were owned by the chairman of the deacons of First Baptist Church. His name, W. W. Samuel, Dr. W. W. Samuel, renowned surgeon. His clinic claimed the top floors of the Medical Arts Building for years, the Samuel Clinic. He was loved and adored in Dallas. In fact, when he died, he left all of his property to the city of Dallas, Samuel Grand Park, Samuel Farm. He left a lot of downtown property, but he owned the houses in the red light district. I'm not bringing forth anything new. That's, it's been printed many other times. But uh, uh, doctor, I've just always been amused that the chairman of the deacons would own the red light district houses. But Dr. Truett began to preach directly to Dr. Samuel. And he sold the houses, burned them down, and that became the end of prostitution in Dallas. They tell me it moved to another spot, but that's another program. I want to tell a bonus story of Dr. Truett, because he also came wanting to build a hospital, a Baptist hospital. Where to get the money? Colonel C.C. Slaughter, very wealthy Baptist, had enough money to build the hospital. It couldn't be named Slaughter Hospital. So they decided to go with the name of the first Baptist missionary in Texas, whose name was R.E.B. Baylor. Thank you, Dr. George Washington Truett. And thank you. This is Dallas, a towering tribute to man's ability to raise beam on beam and stone on stone. From this distance, you don't see the three quarters of a million people who call this city their home. You don't see the 3,000 new residents moving into the area every month. But move in a little closer and you will. You will see a city reaching for a million population, a city with a complex network of lifelines a city with a staggering traffic load. Dynamic growth brings people and growing payrolls. As business grows, population grows, and the snowball keeps rolling until there appears to be no limit to the area's potential. But there is a limit, and it's already pinching. The problem of traffic, a problem of Dallas progress. The movement of traffic to and from the heart of Dallas becomes a more pressing problem day by day. 
In the long lines of inbound and outbound cars and trucks, you can measure the city's heartbeat. More people need to get more places in a shorter span of time, and this movement must be accomplished with adequate safety. To bring this about requires planning and building. The crystal ball to visualize what the future needs will be, and then the follow through to bring those plans to completion. It's not a simple problem involving only one man's decision. It requires the help of everyone, from the traffic officer on the corner of Main and Ackard to the mayor in City Hall. And the need stretches out from the heart of the city to the county line in all directions. Traffic jams cost time and money. They blight a city, driving business elsewhere. Because of its tremendous growth in the past 10 years, Dallas has an even greater and more pressing traffic problem than most cities of its size. Consider these changes in the past decade. In December of 1945, the county had 171,000 workers going to and from their jobs every day. The load was heavy in that day and age for the roads and highways we had then. Today, with more than 322,000 workers on the go in Dallas County, traffic jams are bigger, the delays longer. Again, the cost in time and money more than doubles. Take the downtown section, for instance. Our streets and are no wider than they were 10 years ago. But in that period, 25 new office buildings have pushed up into the skyline. Office buildings jammed with people who head in for their jobs each morning and out in the afternoon. If it were possible to spread their movement over 24 hours, the problem would be simplified. As it is, the congestion all comes at once. Our many and new multiple-story parking garages have solved the problem of storage. They can handle the heavy flow of cars once these vehicles have gotten into the downtown area. But their very existence has created another problem the traffic jams that pile up around their exits and entrances during the rush hours. They demand more and more traffic officers to keep the cars moving. In the past 10 years, automobile registration in Dallas County has climbed to almost a third of a million, including nearly 40,000 commercial trucks and truck tractors. Trucks and tractors spend more time on streets than passenger cars and create their own special problems but they are a necessary part of the city's commerce. Without them, business supplies and food deliveries would dry up in a few short hours. In the same 10-year period, 105,000 new homes have sprouted in the suburbs of the city and county. Again, the problem of greater distances to be traveled by more people. These facts and figures present a challenge to Dallas. They point to the question facing every big city. Can we solve our traffic problem? Fortunately, Dallas has been organized to meet its traffic problems for nearly two decades. The vision and foresight of Carl Rutland back in 1936 resulted in the formation of the Dallas Citizens Traffic Commission. In its first years, it was virtually a one-man crusade. In the past two years, under the leadership of L.H. Howdy Rideout, the Traffic Commission has been broadened to include men and women from every civic group in Dallas County. They have a single purpose, to recommend ways of improving traffic movement and safety. Like any major difficulty, traffic must be analyzed in its separate parts before the whole problem can be solved. To do this, the Dallas Traffic Commission considers each problem in the light of three basic concepts, education, engineering, and enforcement, the three E's of the city's lifelines. Education, engineering, enforcement. The actual job of traffic law enforcement is in the hands of our city police, county sheriff's deputies, and state highway patrolmen. These officers have the monumental daily problem of keeping cars and trucks moving, a problem complicated by cotton bowl spectacles, the Christmas rush, and other events that bring in people from miles around. With these officers lies the responsibility of giving you and me traffic tickets when we violate driving or parking regulations. They are the enforcement arm that bears down on the speeders, curbing the fast driver's impatience and thoughtlessness, reminding them all that they have the same rights, privileges, and responsibilities. 
Their job is also to track down and arrest the drunk driver wherever they find him, often a dangerous job as the irresponsible drunk weaves his thoughtless way through traffic. But if safety is to mean anything, if expressways are to serve their purpose, those who violate the laws must be arrested and convicted so that the law-abiding can drive in safety. The officers must also follow their cases through the courts. Without this effective follow-through, there would be no effective enforcement. Helping clear the log jams in the field of enforcement is the Internal Law Enforcement Committee of the Citizens Traffic Commission. This committee, working closely with various law enforcement agencies, sees to it that the guilty are punished and that citizens charged with minor violations are handled quickly and courteously. Every year in Dallas, thousands of students in our grade and high schools take a long step upward in their maturity. They assume the responsibility of driving the family car. It's not a responsibility that should be taken lightly, for in their trust is a 200 to 300 horsepower motor that easily turns into a weapon of death. Driver training in the schools must be supplemented with home training. Constant reminders of the demand for courtesy and safety on our streets and highways. The juveniles who do not learn these lessons must be punished. And here again is a problem that the Traffic Commission has given much thought to. Through the Commission, Dallas has set up special courts for the handling of juvenile traffic cases. Courts operated by the teenagers themselves. The Juvenile Driver's License Committee meets every week and spends hours with special cases. Their purpose is to see that the driving permits are handled fairly. An advisory function, it's true, but one that saves uncounted hours of time for officials who have the responsibility of screening applicants. The Traffic Commission has done much to relieve problems in and around schools. Driver training equipment and courses have been added. The third countywide Youth for Safety Conference has just been held at Southern Methodist University under the guidance of the Commission. And the Dallas School Program has received first award for the past two years in the National Safety Council's annual safety contest. As more and more cars are added to the city street load, traffic around the individual schools becomes more of a problem. Young children are faced with a death-dealing prospect of dangerous crossings and heavy traffic. The manpower of the Dallas Police Department is not sufficient to provide full-time officers. Through the Citizens Traffic Commission and other groups, part-time officers have been recruited to handle traffic near schools. Well-loved men who are devoted to their charges and their duties. As the youngsters grow older and more responsible, they themselves take an active part in school patrols and even the youngest child respects the red flag of the safety patrolman. This is not an accident. It's an outgrowth of education spearheaded by the Traffic Commission. And Dallas, with one of the finest records in the nation for the safe conduct of children to and from school, owes much to the planning that produced this record. While construction moves ahead, Dallas must make the best of what it has at the moment. Enforcement of traffic laws must continue at a high level. And here, too, a large force within the Traffic Commission does its part to see that the laws are obeyed. A secret group of more than 1,000 men known as T-men are constantly on the alert to spot the speeder who thinks he isn't being observed, the stop sign crasher who is sure no officers are around. Passed on to the police chief and the sheriff, these T-men reports are processed into letters from the lawmen and sent to the violators. Reminders that violations breed accidents and arrests. In some cases, T-men reports have piled up on certain individuals, helping police spot and arrest habitual violators. Perhaps the most complicated group working within the commission is the Engineering Committee. Over the years, this group has made careful studies and many recommendations to city and county traffic agencies. They've kept abreast of such problems as one-way streets, parking, traffic signals, eliminating hazards and bottlenecks. Many of their recommendations are in use today, aiding the flow of traffic at a faster pace, yet with greater safety. 
The newly completed traffic interchange and railroad overpass at Hines Boulevard and Oak Lawn is a prime example of their years of study and recommendations. The building of many private parking garages and lots grew out of the committee's call for the problem to be solved by private enterprise. Off-street parking in the downtown section is largely the result of the committee's planning. But here again, the recommendations on parking and one-way streets require another E of traffic regulation, the E for education. Every businessman wants the end result of more customers, but some are unwilling to accept a one-way street proposition or a no-parking edict because of short-range or imagined penalties. Progress is stymied by these few. Yet even a schoolboy could figure out that downtown streets can't be used at the same time for both car storage and traffic movement as the load increases. Without alleys, our streets must bear the double burden of cars and trucks. The city can't survive as a major shopping center unless both have adequate access to places of business. Education moves on to every thoroughfare with our traffic safety signs. Whether or not the individual driver is conscious of every sign, their frequency around the city soon plants the thought in his mind. Signs like, drunk drivers go to jail, serve not only as a warning, but also as reassurance to the safe and sane driver that the drunks are being taken off the roadways and lodged in the city or county jails. If one driver heeds the warning sign telling him to stay in his own lane, he could be preventing a fatal mishap. The accident-happy drivers may sneer at the signs as pointless cliches, but these careless ones write their own obituaries in the emergency room at Parkland Hospital. If these signs help educate, however indirectly, and help cut down the death, injury, and property loss figures, they have more than proved their worth. These things are being done now. But what of our city's future needs? Dallas needs fast action on a one-way street system for the entire downtown area. Within a month or so, the last of the Dallas Transit Company streetcars will have made its last run. The tracks in many cases, the traffic safety islands, will no longer be needed. And for the first time, a one-way street system for downtown traffic will be feasible. More shoppers will be able to get into the downtown area and essential traffic will be speeded up. At the same time, completion of the expressway loop around the central business district will route through traffic away from the downtown area. Where, at all possible, traffic slowing jogs should be straightened out. Widening of essential arteries is a must, as well as resurfacing. On a long-term basis, we must have a master plan adopted by city officials and covering all phases of transportation and other municipal facilities. We must have certain persons or agencies directly responsible for preparing this plan. And it must be flexible enough to keep one step ahead of the city's development. Provisions must be made for revision so that the plan can best serve the needs of a fast-growing city. And all these long-range plans must be coordinated with capital expenditures so there is a guaranteed continuity along with economic operation. Land buying, zoning, and subdivision control must be tied in, all within the framework of city ordinances that are designed for Dallas growth. There are legislative needs that rank high on the list of essential items. City and county traffic law enforcement should be on the same basis. You can't enforce traffic laws where the penalty is multiplied four times outside the city limits for the same offense inside. Corporation court needs to be streamlined to become more effective. More men are needed on the police department staff. And constantly we must remember that traffic is the lifeblood of the city. Slow down the traffic and the heartbeat slows down. Stop it and the city dies. Dallas people must constantly be informed and aware of what the needs are. Every problem must be measured and met in terms of the three E's, enforcement, engineering, education. Dallas is a great city, and all the greater, because each of us knows it is our city. It will continue to be as great as our vision makes it, and our children after us. But greatness is not a static thing, 
it must be dynamic. Our job, the whole city's job, is to keep the lifelines open and free-flowing. It can be done. It must be done.